So let's talk a little bit more now that we've gotten over the introductory part about what the BBBRC is. Today, I wanna to give you a little bit of history. I wanna give you a general tour of the site and I want to show you how to log on and if you're a new user, how to create an account, it's pretty easy. So it all began on a dark and stormy night. No, no, but in 2004, the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease started funding the Bioinformatic Resource Centers. Originally, there were certain pathogens that they wanted us to concentrate on. And if you had a magnifying glass, you could probably see these things. Maybe you can see them pretty well. So there were the category A, B, and C pathogens that were divided amongst eight different centers. Now, these sent the division of these pathogens didn't necessarily make a lot of sense. I can speak for Patrick 1, and at that we call it Patrick 1, the first iteration of Patrick. And at that, that time, we had three bacterial, um, three bacterial organisms, Rickettsia, Coxiella, and Brucella, and four viral pathogens, Caliche viruses, coronaviruses, and at that time, there was no MERS, no SARS, so coronaviruses, um, well, they're certainly much more important now, aren't they? Lysiviruses and hepatitis E virus. Then in the next iteration, uh, the NIAD asked us, and this started in 2009, to go down to specific uh, BRCs, one, de one um, devoted to viruses, and actually it was, it's been two, IRD, which is the Influenza Research Database in Viper, the Bacterial Database, which is, was Patrick, eukaryotes were all together in UPathDB, and the vectors, which include the mosquitoes, the ticks, lice, things that transmit the bacterial or viral pathogen or in the eukaryotic pathogens were housed in vector base. At this point, Patrick started including all the bacterial genomes because we realized that you couldn't make a distinction between a pathogen and, a, and what makes something pathogenic unless you could compare it to non-pathogens. So these, this iteration of the BRCs went on for two cycles until 2019 when the current cycle was initiated. And at that point, NIAD asked us to combine the bacteria and viruses into one resource center and the eukaryotes and vectors into the second. And the bacterial and viruses, oh, I'm not sure why it's going back, but I'll stop clicking my mouse. Um, the bacterial and viruses were combined into BBBRC, and the eukaryotes and vectors are now, now housed in UPathDB. So this just last week, we launched the new site. We've been working on it for over a year, trying to bring everything in and making it a nice, comfortable home for both of our research communities. You'll notice that across the top, it's called the beta site because we're still working to improve it. And that's why we want your feedback. And I'll keep saying that throughout here, throughout this webinar, is this is we need the communication between us to start, to start so that you can help us shape uh, this resource and guide us in making it something that's, that's very useful for you. Some of the things that are good about the new resource, well, one of the things that's easiest is it's the same logins. Whatever you used for Patrick or IRD or Viper to log into the site, that's gonna work here. The workspace for users of Patrick, you can come in today, log in, and the workspace will look identical. All your data is already there. IRD and Viper users are gonna have to let us know what they want us to migrate over so that we can populate their workspace for them. Both communities will have access to exciting new tools, um, improved searches. There are some new pathogens. One thing that you'll notice is that there are faster loads and improved downloads. So let's go to um, the BBBRC. 
Ah, okay. All right. So I want to give you a quick tour. It probably won't be that quick, but I'll try. I get pretty excited, you'll notice, especially when we start talking about the tools. I use this as I'm logged into my account. You can see from down here that I have completed over 3,000 jobs. I use this site um, almost every day and especially on weekends because I don't have much of a life. So I'm an enthusiastic supporter of the resource. But let's talk about the homepage. Enough about me. Let's talk about what you're here to find out about. You'll notice at the top, there are a number of <clears throat> tabs and I'll get into those in a moment, but I just wanted to orient you to the new homepage. In the top panel, you'll see it's the Bacterial and Viral Bioinformatics Resource Center. There's some information about it. Every time you see these, um, the, the text in blue with an underscore underneath it, that means it's a hyperlink that's gonna take you to more information. So if you wanna click around and, and read more stuff, that's great, go ahead and do that. Also look, provide feedback to the BVBRC team. Here's another place that you can do it because we really want you to, we really want to hear from you. You'll notice that this top panel has a gigantic search button. This is our global search function. Now we do have other searches that I'll discuss briefly today and we'll actually have a webinar uh, devoted to, but I just wanted to give you some background information about what happens to data when it comes into the BBBRC. Be it viral, be it bacterial, when we bring in data from GenBank, and where do we get our data? Well, we get it from GenBank. In some instances, especially for like antimicrobial resistance data, we've been going into SRA, we've been reading papers about these large studies, and generally those people don't put that data into GenBank because it's, um, it's a lot to do. So they just dump that data into the SRA. We've been pulling that data out. We've been um, assembling it and annotating it. And it's available here in this resource. And the reason why we do that, other than we want to share it with our community, but also we've been running our own machine learning algorithms on it to, in order to identify areas of the genomes that are associated with antimicrobial, antimicrobial resistance or susceptibility. So we get data like that as well in the resource. Um, we get some from sequencing centers, although those generally go into GenBank eventually. And then there's a lot of data that's your data, our user community that's only available to you, but we've got that data in there as well. So when, but when the public data comes in that we're sharing that everybody can see, we take the biosample information, we take the bioprojects information. In the GenBank records, often researchers will provide a very detailed description of why that genome is important and why they spent money sequencing it and analyzing that. We parse all that out and we make that searchable. So you can use this uh, global search thing. You could search for GenBank IDs. You could search for our IDs. You could search for countries. You could search for hosts. You could search for something like isolation sites like blood or um, gut, something like that. And you should, if you were to drill in and click genomes or something else, or you can, um, define how exact your search you want, you should be able, if I chose genomes and blood, I should be able to pull up all the genomes within BBBRC that have blood somewhere in their description. So, I mean, that is, for me, that's really cool and really hard to do in any other resource. I can't do that at GenBank. So even though that data is all here, it allows you to find that data. I see there's one question. Let me look in on that. Will this resource also access all the new data being mandated for deposit under the new NIH open data guidelines? 
uh, I guess if it's genomic, it will. Maybe we should let um, it, maybe Malik could respond to that in the chat message so that. Uh, yeah, can... so I think there are certain uh, data types uh, that are available in public repository that we routinely pick up and make it available, accessible uh, under the open uh, data and the FAIR principles uh, provided by NIH. Uh, I think uh, it depends on the data type. So the genomic data, the experimental data, transcriptomic data, proteomic data, those are uh, kind of like you know, within the scope of the current BRC. Uh, if there are data types which are more emerging in nature, uh, then I think uh, we take it like you know case by case basis and see how we can generalize it and make it part of the infrastructure. I but you could also it. contact us and yeah. ask us if we can host this data for you, because we've done that certainly in the past. And can okay. you guys monitor the chats so that yeah, we are monitoring it. Okay, all right. We also noticed that we have um, browse that will lead you directly. Rebecca, there's one more question there. Malik, can you answer that one as well? Are the metadata uh, yes. curated so before posting? The question is, uh, are the metadata curated before posting? Uh, so we have automated metadata curation uh, or uh, 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 standardization pipelines. We take the initial metadata that's available from uh, uh, the GeneBank records, uh, the biosamples, bio project, and uh, other related information. And then we use this uh, auto metadata curation pipeline to standardize the data. Uh, so as we, Rebecca walks you through some of the other data types, we can talk about it in more detail. But metadata curation is an ongoing process. Uh, and uh, we continually review it and go back and uh, clean up the metadata uh, as kind of like, you know, standard using the standardized terms, uh, dictionaries and things like that. We used to go in and do it all manually. It just became, as the number of genomes increased, it became overwhelming. But we are constantly trying to revise the way that we do it to improve it. And um, the IRD Viper folks have done a lot to help with that and help us. And so what they have done in the past we've now brought into the BBBRC and made it applicable across the bacteria. Like now you can do host groups and things like that that are pretty or geographic locations as opposed to just countries, which is, I think it's been very helpful for me. So I'm very appreciative of it. Okay, so browsing, you can click on each of these and it'll take you to a landing page for those organisms. And you may be thinking, what? Eukaryotic hosts? Those aren't bacteria or viruses. They are not, but they get infected by bacteria and viruses. And we have an RNA-seq pipeline where you can use specific host um, response uh, algorithms to analyze the, uh, the response to infection with those pathogens. So that's why we have them there. Also notice that we have news and announcements up in the upper right corner that you can click through to see what's going on. We have our Twitter feed right on the front page. We use this primarily papers of interest, um, disease outbreaks across the globe. But also one of the things that we try very strongly to do is if you cite us in your publication, and I see that in PubMed, I go into your publication and I look at how you use the resource and then I promote you on the BBBRC social media channels. So this is how we're working together. You're citing me and I'm promoting your publication because we, we wanna help make your research recognized and we appreciate your using our resource and citing us. The middle panel, breaks down some of the stuff that you see in the tab. You can get into all the searches. You can get into all the tools and services. There's a way to look at the workspace from here, to upload data and access your jobs. And also, this has become more and more important. As the data gets uh, bigger and the bioinformatic pipelines get more important and complicated, we have more and more people who are um, 
bioinformaticians and computational biologists who don't need the GUI. So we provide them with a command line interface so they can go in and sweep out all the data and analyze it to their heart's content in the privacy of their own home, or they can use our services as well via command line and you never have to do this clicking again if you don't want to. There's also the data API and the FTP. We also have um, help in the quick start, reference guides and tutorials, direct links to those. And then at the bottom, there are information for the Patrick users specifically and for the IRD Viper users. The ones where, I mean, Patrick users, you guys are gonna be okay. You may not like coming to a new site, but I promise you eventually you're going to love it because you'll find out there's a lot more here than there was at Patrick. IRD Viper users, you're going to like it too, but you're going to need some help to get there. So please contact us, reach out to us and tell us what you need and we're here to help you. Now I want to go into the tabs across the top because that is the way I use the system and I'm most comfortable with it. So let's click on the organisms tab. This opens a drop down box that shows you at the highest level bacterial pathogens, viral families, and featured viruses in this hodgepodge kind of collection down here. You'll notice that the bacterial pathogens are all at the genus level. Now, just this week, this happens to me all the time. People contact me and they say, oh, I would love to use your site but you don't have mine, I don't have any, I'm not working on any of these genera. I work on cyanobacteria, so I can't use your site. And I have to tell them, oh, no, 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 you can use it. All of our tools, all of our services are available for all those things. It's just that these are the pathogens of most concern right now, the bacterial pathogens. So we provide direct links to the landing page for each of those genera. Also for the viruses, these are the viral families that have those pathogens of concern. Each of these, if you click on that, it's going to take you to the landing page for that organism. And that's what we're going to drill down more deeply into in the um, upcoming webinar series. You'll also notice that we have featured viruses. These are more at the species level except for bacteriophages, of course, things that are currently important. Like imagine three years ago, SARS coronavirus 2 wouldn't be there, but it's certainly there now. And then we have, of course, direct links to all bacteria, all archaea, all viruses, and the eukaryotic hosts. We're going to have, I'm clicking on the search tab now, we ta I talked a little bit about the global search, which is here, but this comes mainly from the IRD and Viper side. And they have taught us a lot uh, from the Patrick side about how to help people drill in to information in this great sea of data that we currently have. Finding the data that's most relative to, relevant to you can also can sometimes be a challenge. And so we have these new advanced search criteria that we'll go into in detail, but I'm just going to click on one so you can see what it's like. So remember keywords, because we parse out all that data, you can put anything in here. You can fill in each of these parameters if you so choose, but you can see we have higher level things like host group or host name or geographic group, or isolation country, the years of collection, the length of the genome, is it complete or not? And we also provide additional criteria, other things. This will all, we hope, help you drill down to find the things that you need to complete your analyses. Let's go into tools and services and let me apologize in advance because I get very excited about these things and I talk um, excessively about them, but I've been trying, I've been practicing and trying to, to um, hold myself in and not go too heavy on these things. These services that we have in the BBBRC, this is the 
list of them now, you'll notice that some of them end in a B, some of them have a V at the end, and some of them have nothing at all at the end. If it ends in a B, it means right now it's only for bacteria. If it ends in a V, it means right now it's um, limited to viruses. And if it doesn't have any designation after it, it means that you can use this whatever organism you're working with. Let me note here, even as I say this, assembly ends in a B, but we recently, just last week, had a researcher contact us and said, can I use the assembly service for my influenza viruses? And we found out that you could. So um, once again, dialogue's important. Reach out to us, give it a try. And we worked, um, we went to a little bit of effort to make sure that this would flow very well for this researcher. And we'd be happy to do that for you as well. Now, what I'm gonna do is talk a little bit about these services. And when you submit <clears throat> a job in Patrick, oh, see, it's, a, it's for me too, it's BVBRC. When you submit a new job to the BVBRC, it does a number of things. It will give you a bunch of download files. I mean, if it's assembly, it'll give you contigs, it'll give you a bandage plot, things like that will come with it. So I'm just gonna be showing you some teasers of these things, but it won't be the exhaustive uh, thing of what you get when you submit this job. That will be covered on the April 1st webinar. So for assembly, I just wanna click on that real quick. We have a bunch of different strategies that we allow for people to use. And I just wanted to show you one of the things that comes with the assembly job. And it, that job comes with an assembly report that includes a bandage plot. And then it tells you things about your assembly. Now, generally, if you're doing, um, an analysis that eventually leads to a publication, this would be pretty early in the process and you might forget which assembler was used and you might forget all of this information and like the coverage and how many contigs it was. We provide all that, it's all here for you in your workspace so that you can refer to it when it comes time to publish um, your paper. And let me, let me he also say that when I talk about these tools, it's not just a few people using it. Since we've started putting in bioinformatics services in the resource, we've had more than 820,000 jobs submitted. And that leads me to annotation, which is by far the most popular job or that people request. It, you can do bacteria and archaea or viruses or bacteriophages. Now, when you analyze, when you annotate a genome in BVBRC, it provides you with a number of things, but most importantly, there is a virtual integration now with your data, with all of the data in the resource. So, although you can only see your private data, nobody else can see it. You can compare it to any of the public data. So you can build trees with it and compare it to any of the public genomes. You can compare the proteomes. You can look for the most similar genomes. So that's why it is such a popular service. And I wanted to give you a quick show of what it looks like. One of the things that comes with it when we were first offering this service, I would find that a lot of people had no concept of if their data was any good or not. And um, so we started with adding in these reports that tell you with each uh, genome annotation that you do, it gives you an estimate of completeness. It tells you if there's any contamination. It gives you some idea about the genome itself. It looks at things and says, hmm, there are 41 genes here that we didn't expect that are unique to your genome. And moreover, there are 
24 genes here that we expected it to have because everybody else has it and yours doesn't, you might want to look into this and it gives you ways to do that. Oops, it's jumping a little bit. Um, oh, comprehensive genome analysis. When we first started uh, the providing bioinformatics services, people would have to do an assembly and then they'd have to do an annotation. And when we were giving workshops, it was click, 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 a lot of clicking and we didn't want them to get carpal tunnels. So we have the brilliant idea of let's provide one service for them so they can start with read files or assembled contents. And I just, this is a very popular service that we have. We have it not only for um, bacteria, but also for SARS coronavirus. And this is a report that comes down with it. It gives you information about your assembly, about your annotation. It tells you about the proteins that were annotated. It gives you this nice um, figure. It details a functional analysis of your genome. It tells you if there are any genes that you might want to look into. Remember when I talked about that machine learning of antimicrobial resistance that we do? It, it looks for those in your particular genome and it gives you a quick and dirty tree to, I call it, it's not dirty of course, but I call it a quick and dirty tree because it's just taking five genes and it's trying to tell you, hey, is this who you thought you were looking at? Because often people will say to me, oh, your annotation <laughs> pipeline is wrong because I my clostridium genome is coming up as something else. And then they find out that their sample was contaminated. And we can talk about that when we get to the metagenomics part. Every bioinformatics resource center has BLAST. And I talked briefly about the SARS-CoV-2 annotation. Similar genome finder, this is another important step once you have your genome annotated in Patrick, or you could, um, sorry, in BDDRC, or you have FASTA files or read files and you wanna know who they are before you start the process, you can upload those here and see within the resource how many genomes or what the closest genomes are to yours so you get an idea of who you have, who's there who's in that vial of DNA that you took the trouble to isolate. Uh, Metacats is an IRD Viper tool. Phylogenetic tree. This is only for bacteria at this point. This is a whole genome process where you can bring in up to 200 genomes and create a phylogenetic tree and use oh, up to a thousand genes. That would take a long time, but uh, go ahead, depending on, on what you want. I want to show you one of the things I like about this service, which is very popular with our users. Not only does it give you a tree, but it gives you this phylogenetic report that comes down with it that shows you the tree with the support values on it. It gives you the anal uh, analysis statistics. I there were 28 genomes. I requested 500 genes that it be built on, but it could only find 249 based on the criteria. But look at this. I mean, I'll get to that in a second. It tells you the number of aligned amino acids and the number of aligned nucleotides. I guarantee you, if you have statistics like that and you put them in your manuscript, there's not going to be a reviewer that's going to question the strength of your tree. So let's go back to this. I requested 500 and I only got 249. Pardon me while I scroll. It goes past the genomes, the information about the genes, the information about um, the genomes and the genes that were used. And I've had reviewers say to me, what genes were used? I need a list of the genes that were used um, to create this tree. And so often I'll just plop this into the supplementary files and that will really quiet a reviewer and they won't ask for that. They won't ask me for that again. But at the bottom, if you didn't get the number of genes you want, just one second, let me finish this and then I'll say that. 
It tells you what genomes you can emit from the analysis and how many genes it will be able to include in that. I'm just a biologist. I'm not a coder. This really helps me. Okay, what's the question? Was there one? Yes, yeah, so someone was asking about for the similar genome finder, what's used, used to find, determine similarity? It's, it's, MASH, it's MASH MinHash and it's based on KMERS. Right. So if, if there's a cutoff, so we do have a cutoff built in and is it tunable? Uh, I'm not sure if we expose the tune. I don't know if we can. I, it's not. not, it's not on the interface that we could do it. We would have to ask one of the people who do the service if you could do that by the command line. The cutoffs are, are used at the time of building the underlying database. Uh, so we determine it based on the uh, nature of the genome. So for bacteria, it's kind of like, you know, use in different parameters right now. Currently, it works only for bacteria, but we are planning to extend it to uh, and make it searchable for viruses as well. Okay. Um, all right, I have another one. I know people are gonna get tired of me clicking on these things, but this has the most beautiful visualization. Probably many of you have used Mob, and there's a server for it, but I think we're the only place that has it available in a resource where you can look at it. And this was taking a little bit of time to load earlier. Oh, isn't that lovely? See, it's worth the wait. I just love that thing. I just think it looks so clear and crisp. And even though I, you know, will use Mob too, I really like the way this, this looks. If this is a beta version, we're in the process of making it so that you can download a publishable figure with it. But I just wanted to point out that it has all the features of MOP, like I can drill in to see the individual genes and stuff. And uh, just for pure beauty, uh, this is one of my favorite, fa favorite tools. Uh, we brought in from IRD Viper Primer Design and I, you know, I don't know why we didn't have this before in Patrick, because our users have been asking for it since the very beginning, and it took the good people at JCVI to give it to us so we could provide it to all of you. But when you run it with it, there's a number of um, downloadable files that come with it, but it includes a table like this that shows you all the details of the analysis. So finally, primer design for all. Uh, Oh, the variation service. I'm sure you're going to get sick of hearing me <laughs> say this because this is another one of my favorite tools. You can compare your reads to a reference genome and look for SNPs, MMPs, deletions, and some inversions. We offer four different aligners and two different SNP collars. And these aren't things that we've done. These are the, these pipelines are generally things that are well accepted by the community. We bring them in and make it easy for the biologists. Not A lot of people are not computer scientists. They can't run these programs on their own. And so we have them here in the GUI, but we also have them on the command line so people can run them there too. And just to give you a quick look-see at what that looks like, one of the things that comes down with that is a table that tells you of the samples that you submitted, comparing them to your reference on this contig in this position, there was this change, these scores, it tells you if it's synonymous or non-synonymous. It tells you what the change was in the nucleotide, in the codon, in the amino acid, gives you some information about the gene. And then at the very end, it tells you if it's a low, moderate, or high um, impact SNP. And like this one has a frame shift variation. And so I use this one a lot and it's really valuable. And it, but it's this right now, it's only for bacteria for the whole genome level. But we do have an MSA and SNP variation service at the gene level and for viruses too. And that looks something like this. We have a new service that we, we brought in from IRD Viper, which is the gene tree, which gives you 
a handy dandy little phylogenetic tree with some of the metadata associated with it for specific genes. We also have, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, Proteome Comparison. This is one of our earliest tools and it's very popular. You create, have one reference genome and compare it up to, with up to nine comparison genomes. It's a bi-directional blast analysis. Now I, as I said, I look at all the papers and look at how they use Patrick. And I can tell you that this figure, this and the trees, are some of the most commonly used figures that are that researchers who use our, our, the BBBRC use in their publications. Because look at it, it's beautiful. It's almost as beautiful as the mauve one, but it just is showing you the strength of the hits across the entire genome. So a lot of people like this and they put it in their publications. We also have metagenomics and we have metagenomic read mapping where we blast your reads against specialty gene databases. But we just, within the past like three or four years, we launched into taxonomic classification. This is using Kraken and it'll take your sample and tell you what's in it. And this is just an example of one of the things that comes, comes in. And this is actually a funny example because it was given to me when someone was complaining about the tree and they didn't like the way their genome looked on the tree and they thought the annotation service was bad because they thought it was one thing and it was one other thing. And when we ran it through taxonomic classification, we could see that this was a mixed sample, which they hadn't expected. And not only, I mean, I just run every genome that I get through this just to check and make sure everything's okay, but also because I like the diagram because I can play with it and mess around with it and it's just fun. All right. Metagenomic binning is a service we've had for a couple of years. And this one is really good because it helps pull from a mixed sample. It's trying to pull out high quality genomes out of it. So let me show you what that looks like. This is one of the reports that comes down. And this one, like this is an interesting sample that I was looking at for the tick webinar series. They took the malpigian tubules of the ticks, they crushed them, and then they isolated, they annotated, they, well, I got the reads from the sequ uh, sequence read archive. And from it, I was able to extract from this particular um, read set a, complete Coxiella genome and a nearly complete Rickettsia genome, although there was some contamination. Now what's beautiful about this is it's just like the annotation service. I can take this genome, I can use it to build trees. Actually, I can take both of them, use it to build trees. I did the proteome comparison with that. Oh, it's just so much fun. And I encourage you to uh, be like me and enjoy using all these different tools and playing with it. Under transcriptomics, we have the RNA-seq analysis. Now we've had Tuxedo and host HiSat2 for a while. And so I would encourage you to go ahead and use that, but this is a new pipeline that we're in beta with. And so if you have bacterial samples, what I would suggest you do is use Tuxedo and go ahead and do that but then also run it with this. And if it meets the parameters, we're working on fine tuning what comes with this service and uh, providing more information about it. But I, I just wanted to show you some of the downloads that are coming with it that we're gonna mash into a report. And so we have heat maps showing the most highly expressed, um, differentially expressed genes. It has volcano plots. It has violin diagrams. I mean, how awesome is that? And looking for where it, this is trying to help you drill into your data and see what's important about it. Unfortunately, with the data I use, they're all pretty similar. But imagine, you can imagine what it's like if it's um, something really if it's your data and they're expressing in different ways, 
just being able to have these charts available for your publication would, I think, be pretty awesome. All right. The last thing I'm really going to get into is the FASTQ utilities. I never used to use this. I always used to trust that my sequencing center would only hand me the most quality, high quality data. But I've been finding out that sometimes those things don't happen and I need to run a check of my data before I do things. So we provide different pipelines within the FASTQ utilities, which include trim, if like if the adapters have been left on, that can sometimes mess up downstream processes like assembly. Paired filters, if when they're doing paired reads, the forward strand, there are a lot more of those than on the reverse strand. We found out that that can screw up your assembly process. So this will even things out. FASTQC will tell you um, the quality of your reads and the align function. I've been using this so much lately. I had somebody say, if your RNA-seq service doesn't work, I ran my sample against my reference genome and it didn't return anything. And when I ran it, I could see why, because only 1.2% of their reads mapped. So this is all just the informative stuff and you can tie all these things together into your own special little workflow to help you look at the quality of your data, get it into, get it the best assembly and annotation you can, and then do all the downstream analyses. So shoo, you say, that, that's all she's, she's done with tools and services. But wait, now we have workspaces. <laughs> okay. So any registered user of BVBRC gets a home workspace where your private data can go in. We give you these three um, folders for you to put things through, but you can make it as messy or as organized as you want. You can put in images, you can put in Excel files, you can put in your reads, you can put in your contigs, you can put in your RNA-seq data. We don't limit you on that. Moreover, if you are working with different people, if you have a collaborative group, you can create a shared workspace that you share amongst people. And I can show you one of these that I'm part of is, this is something that only their four members can see. And this is something that's, whoops, well, that's no good, Andrew. Is that the one? Yeah. And so the read files are shared amongst all of us. I could put, he's got a readme text in here that's just between us. Now, we also have the ability to create a public workspace. And you might think, I mean, we're all, for those of us who are biologists, we're really protective about our data, right? We don't want to make anything published because we might get scooped. So why would I want to have a public workspace? Well, let me show you why this might be good for you. This is a public workspace that I created for a free course, Bacterial Bioinformatics, that I have on Coursera. And so 5,000 people are taking this class right now, and this is where they come. This is where their assignments are. And so when they're in the Comprehensive Genome Analysis section, they can click on that. They can see their assignment. They can get the context that they need from that. They can get the read files that they need. And this is for building a hybrid assembly, which we also provide in BBBRC, just saying. So imagine if you're teaching a class and you want the class, rather than having some Google Doc or something, you can have all of that here. You can have the papers in here. You can have the Excel sheets in here. You can have images that you want to show the members of your class. Moreover, imagine you're publishing your paper and you could make a public workspace for the reviewers to come to. And not only the reviewers, but later on the people who are reading your manuscript so that they can do this analysis. I review a lot of papers. I generally bring it into BBBRC, the data that if they have it public to see if I can see the, what they say about their data is true. So you can imagine how you can use this, this for your own work. Now let's go to, I'm just closing that, to the help section. 
we realize that this may take um, a learning curve to get you guys started. So we're trying really hard to find these things for you. We have a quick start. We have quick references. We have tutorials, exhaustive tutorials that show you how to step through everything and also include all the references you will need for publication. Because like if you used assembly and unicycler, it'll have it in here so that you don't have to go in and find the reference. You'll know exactly what it is. We have common tasks where people get stuck. The command line interface tutorials. We have webinars, we have instructional videos. There's information about our workshops. And once again, contact us because that's very important. We need to hear from you. Let us know where you're having problems. If you don't tell us, we'll never know. And then finally, the about tab. There, this is more information about us, how you can contact us, our team, announcements, our calendar, our publications, um, our citations, other resources that are related to us. The BVBRC GitHub, we everything here is public. In our GitHub are all the scripts and pipelines for you. If you want them and you're a bioinformatician and you just want to grab it and go with it, knock yourself out. That's where you find it. It's all there. And if you're looking for something and you can't find it there, what do you do? You contact us and we help you get it because we have nothing to hide. And finally, every so often people are worried about our privacy policy. Here it is, and it tells us how we secure your data. Now, as the very last of this, because I know everybody's, their eyes, they probably, several people have probably fainted in their chairs at, some time, at this point, but I just have one last thing to show you, is how to log in. <clears throat> this shows me this cute little icon here. This is me, but I'm going to log out. So if I am new to the resource, I would need to click the register button. And in it, it will ask me for my email address for whatever username I want. You can be creative. You can have your super secret identity or something you wish your parents had called you. Your first name, your last name, and the other stuff, add that. Sometimes it I mean, we're always interested in where you work, not, you know, not in a creepy way, <laughs> but if you want to include that, that, include that. And then when you filled everything in, you would click register. When that happens, you get an email from us. So check your inbox, the inbox of this email address. In fact, you know what, when you fill it all out, take a screenshot just so you can refer to it. Because just in the past week, we've had several people who have multiple email addresses and they have forgotten which one they used. And so they're telling me they didn't hear from me, but that's because it went to an email they don't currently use. So when it comes to your email, that will give you the instructions for setting your password to create your own workspace. So find that, click on that. If you don't get that email, check in your spam folder or your trash folder. Some of your web, uh, email services sometimes route, they think, can you believe it, that they think are the emails from us or spam or trash. So look for it there. If you didn't get it, what do you do? Contact us. And that comes to me and then I tell the developer in charge of registration, go fix this person's problem ASAP. So then once it's fixed in, fixed, and you have it, you click sign in. I click in my name. I click in my password. And leave me alone there. And there I am again. So that in a nutshell, is this whirlwind tour of the new BBBRC site. The one thing I want you to come away with is the webinar series for you to use and the contact us when you have problems. So I've opened up for any questions that you might have.
for those of you who are currently awake and haven't slammed your heads on the desk and frustration. If you have any questions, just unmute your mic and feel free to speak up. Or not. Rebecca, maybe just click on the webinar link one more time up there, just so that the webinar series link, just so like, you know, uh, actually down to the, where the actual webinar. Oh, here we go. Sorry. It's clickety click. Oh, see, see, there's all this stuff that I didn't include because I couldn't, because I only have an hour if we had the whole day, which I'm sure you'd love to sit here and listen to me blab on we would be able to show you these kind of things. But I'm just going to um, say that, yeah, the, what the topics are for the next ones too. Yeah. So next Friday, it's bacteria. The 11th, it's viruses. The 18th, it's the private workspace. The 25th, it's searches and creating um, groups for you to analyze. And the first, it's tools and services, April 1st. And you would think, how could, they, how could she even talk any more about tools and services? That's all she talked about. But believe me, I can go on. And I will on that one to show you more things that you